When I say system, of course, it's something different from the state. So the you know, illusion at the time among people, and I belong to, the, to those people at the time, was that, uh, okay, communism would go away pretty much like in, uh, I don't know, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Poland. Uh, but, uh, you know, we would still live in, in the same state. So very few people paid very close attention to uh, ethnic separatism, Baltic bit of independence, and would say, oh, it's not only the Balts. If the Balts go, uh, then it would be, you know, a, a falling domino effect. And of course, very few people, I repeat, understood the implications of the Russian drive for sovereignty and declaration of sovereignty. Um, so people inside uh, the Soviet Union, particularly in Moscow, where the center of action always was during those times, they continued to shake things in expectation that, you know, one more push and the, the, the rotten communist system would fall apart. But they never, never expected that with the system, the state itself would fall apart. I'm Bryce Clem, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, December 27th, 2021. This past weekend marked the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union. To discuss the collapse and its implications, I sat down with Vladislav Zubuk, professor of international history at the London School of Economics and author of the new book, Collapse, The Fall of the Soviet Union. We covered a range of topics, including Mikhail Gorbachev's economic and political reforms, Professor Zubuk's experience reading Solzhenitsyn for the first time, and the Russian military's recent buildup along Ukraine's borders. It's the Lawfare Podcast, December 27th, The Fall of the Soviet Union with Vladislav Zubuk. So why did you write this book? Well, I was born in the Soviet Union and uh, grew up there, so when I was uh, around 30 or so, uh, Gorbachev started reforms in Perestroika, and uh, I participated in what can be called um, a democratic movement, uh, where people for the first time in their lives discussed things freely. So people around me were full of hopes. So when things began to go wrong, and uh, uh, in just a few years, the Soviet Union collapsed, it was a huge shock for, for many people and people related it to diverse causes, including democratization. So people began to relate democracy to chaos and destruction of the state. So and foreign influences such as Western influences. So at some point I uh, began to search for an answer why exactly uh, the Soviet Union that had all kinds of structural problems, uh, economic and so on and so forth, why nevertheless it collapsed so suddenly and so quickly? So it was not a question why the Soviet Union collapsed, it was why it collapsed so suddenly and, and rapidly and thoroughly. Uh, and I couldn't find any answer in the existing literature. And uh, since I teach students, every time students ask me, Professor, how do you, can you explain that the same country that withstood the onslaught of uh, Wehrmacht during World War II, uh, collapsed so suddenly without any war or any evident pressure. Uh, I had no clear answer to this, and I decided to write this book to explain it to myself and to my students. So I'm curious, what new sources, if any, did you have access to, and, and how did that uh, help you sort of form your arguments? There are more sources than uh, you can imagine. Uh, that was the period when everyone discussed things freely and openly, and uh, that was in a pu- that is in the public domain. Plus, there are electronic archives which helped me during the time of COVID and self isolation. There are just thousands and thousands of documents and uh, oral histories, uh, you know, audio interviews, even newsreels of all sorts uh, collected in, in several uh, useful archives. Plus, on the Western side, I used a lot the documents from the Bush presidential library. They, for instance, released all conversations with Gorbachev and Yeltsin and other uh, leaders uh, at that time uh, related to the Soviet Union. So I used that widely. And my preference was, you know, given the abundance of sources, my preference was not to memoirs when people, after all, recall later what happened, but to the documents 
of uh, first class, of primary nature. So when people, for instance, discussed something at the time, in 1990, 1991, and my task was not to to explain fully why people acted in the, in this or that way. It is near, it's nearly impossible with the revolutionary events like, like this. But how did people feel? In what sense they were surprised by what was happening? So uh, in my book, I sort of try to restore the atmospherics of the time because I remember myself uh, rather clearly uh, 30, 31, 32 years ago when I was much younger and I was full of ideals and ideas. You know, how did it feel at the time and to what extent it contributed to the outcome? Let's jump into the book and some of the narratives that you push back against. I think it's a pretty common refrain in in the West, at least, that, oh, the collapse of the Soviet Union was completely inevitable. Gorbachev, when he came to power, he was handed a failing system and there was nothing he could really do. And it sort of unraveled. And you really push back against that. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Uh, yes, I do. I do, because I found it uh, strange that the same people who could not predict uh, such a rapid uh, unraveling of, of the Soviet system and even the Soviet state quickly assumed that uh, what happened was inevitable. And the sense uh, the, the the word inevitability, in my view, should not be applied to history at all. You know, This is the way we try to teach our students. Nothing is inevitable. It's all uh, the combination of structural factors and human agency and various contingencies, like, you know, for instance, the Chernobyl disaster happened, nobody expected it, lots of casualties, how did it affect uh, the situation? So I write about it. And, you know, what I found already in the process of collecting my material and writing the book, that all those things that uh, were cited by by a number of authors as an indisputable cause for the Soviet collapse, such as uh, the burden of the arms race against the United States, the anti-alcohol campaign by Gorbachev that cost budget a lot of money, uh, the Chernobyl disaster, the falling oil prices, uh, you know, the war in Afghanistan, a number of other issues. All that taken together uh, did not really overtaxed the Soviet budget and did not destabilize the Soviet financial and economic system. And I was surprised, you know, why people keep repeating these uh, factors as something self-evident, and then they dismiss the, the discussion about the Soviet collapse. It looks like people don't want to re reopen this issue and go back. And more surprisingly, it concerns my countrymen, the Russians, uh, who, of course, assume that that was bygone. They didn't want to go back to, to that traumatic event of 1991. They prefer to go beyond it and discuss what happened there after that. So as more like, I don't know, psychological, cognitive factors. But nevertheless, I decided, uh, you know, I should stick with it. I should address this issue in a really focused way and come up with uh, my new paradigm. And my new paradigm essentially is that uh, without Gorbachev's reforms and uh, the way they destabilized the system, particularly economic and financial uh, system, uh, nothing like what we saw in 1989, 91 would have been possible. The Soviet Union would have existed for years and years. So that's that's a perfect segue. Let's talk about Gorbachev, the man. What was his ideology? I mean, you you refer to him repeatedly in the book as a neo-Leninist. So for the non-Soviet experts, what do you mean by that? Well, Lenin was somebody uh, that had been considered almost a secular deity uh, at the time when Gorbachev grew up, even at the time when I grew up, I'm much younger. Uh, we were taught that Lenin was the founder of the Soviet state. Lenin was an ideal figure, was a revolutionary he wanted justice for all, for everyone. Uh, he started anti-colonial struggle around the world and all those good things. What we were not told was that uh, Lenin, you know, created a dictatorship, used violence, uh, instigated mass killing, and he was a true teacher of Stalin in many ways. So for Gorbachev, who was, after all, a student of the late 40s and early 50s when Stalin was alive and Stalin died, Gorbachev was at the Moscow State University. For Gorbachev, it was kind of, you know, an adopted uh, binary of sorts. Uh, good Lenin, bad Stalin. 
uh, he didn't look beyond that uh, sort of social uh, dualism, socialist dualism, with, with a good leader that had uh, found founded the state and the bad leader that took things, you know, astray. So I think he continued to revolve within this uh, dual kind of, you know, uh, paradigm throughout the 70s and even the 80s, to my surprise. What, what surprised me and why it surprised me, you know, when I was young, I, I even read Lenin and tried to understand what went wrong. And then at some point, that was in the 70s, I realized that all this just, you know, a failed ideology and uh, you wouldn't find any answers in this, you know, reading Lenin only basically discovering that Lenin was even worse than Stalin in some ways. What surprised me that Gorbachev never drew this conclusion. And even when he read such authors as Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was a ardent anti-communist, even that did not push him to abandon the ideals of, of, of socialism. He only basically decided, okay, if Lenin is not as good as I imagined, I would accomplish this uh, task of transforming socialism into a socialism with a human face. So I think this is what, this is what he tried to do. Um, he continued to read Lenin uh, in 89, 90 in search of various clues. He couldn't find those clues, for instance, what to do with nationalities, what to do with economy. In fact, what he found in Lenin, Lenin were all wrong and even disastrous answers to the predicament that the Soviet Union was in. Um, so I think it's a paucity of usable past, the paucity of Gorbachev not being able to reach out and find something useful for him. What he found was, uh, on the contrary, very harmful for his reforms. And of course, it was he's not he was not alone. He was surrounded by people who had belonged to his cohort of people who grew up, grew up in the uh, 50s and the 60s. Uh, you know, it would have been much better if he had relied on much younger people, probably. Before we jump into his reforms and what he actually did, you mentioned something interesting there that he, he read Social Needs in. And one thing that really struck me in the book was, was how you describe how he was sort of an, an academic while he was in charge. And I was wondering if you could talk about his management style a little bit or lack of of a management style that he had. And also it really surprised me that he read sort of for, forbidden literature while he was in charge. That that came to me as a, as a surprise. Well, it didn't come to me as a surprise because there was a special printing section in, uh, in this, inside the party that printed a limited number of uh, so-called forbidden books and texts for the party functionaries who could take them home and even I, at some point in Moscow, you know, my my classmate invited me to his house, and I found the Solzhenitsyn on the shelf. I was in complete shock, and then he said, "Oh, my father works for the Central Committee apparatus of the party, so you know, here we are." So instead of uh, drinking vodka and and then chatting with girls, I I took one of Solzhenitsyn's volume and and and, and began <laughs> to devour it. It also just tells you how strange life was in, in those days. So that is not a surprise. What is surprising, again, it's Gorbachev, who had been uh, sort of cast back to provinces after graduating from the Moscow State University, and he found himself among those, you know, crass middle-level apparatchiks who had no intellectual pursuits at all, no ethics at all, and for him, he felt like, you know, being cast away on an island and his wife, of course, was also graduate of Moscow State University, uh, Raisa. And two of them cultivated an intellectual lifestyle. So they decided, not, not, you know, we will not be consumed by all this provincial morass. We will educate ourselves. We will read books, sociology, political science, philosophers, and things like that. So Gorbachev, in fact, under the influence of his wife, who was a sociologist uh, and philosopher, he sort of became like a little bit of philosophical himself, maybe too philosophical for a practical leader of such a complex country as the Soviet Union. So I discovered time and again, when there was a time of decision, it doesn't mean he, he could make a decision. He, he made pretty tough decisions in 1987, 88. Uh, but then something happened when he sort of uh, grew out of predictable solutions he didn't know what to do, and he continued to discuss them with all kinds of people. He continued to theorize about those issues, and 
it remained sort of paralyzed on a practical level. He, he just couldn't make any practical decisions. He had to find the right theoretical explanation to them. So that's, that's kind of a bizarre problem uh, that they hobbled him uh, since, I would say, early 1989. So let's let's talk about some of those economic reforms of, of Perestroika, 87, 88. I was wondering if you could just sort of give a, a brief overview of those for our listeners who, who haven't been studying this recently. Well, you know, it's, 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 that's, that's a problem. I, I tried myself to understand what was happening, and my uh, economic education was not sufficient uh, to understand it. Then I got some help from economists, and there are very few economists who actually – can comment on Soviet type of economy. It was such an unusual type of economy. We we know only cliches on well, central central planning. There was constant deficit. They couldn't buy even a toilet paper without standing queues, and all those cliches, which in part were true, but they didn't explain well how the system worked. And um, economists uh, who worked in the, inside the Soviet system and analyzed it explained to me that. You know, it was indeed a centralized system based on very curious idea of uh, management and financial management, especially. For instance, you know, uh, it was highly integrated. So the chain of uh, supply and, uh, you know, uh, and production was like, you know, all country web tying together all the republics, all the regions. So it was impossible to disentangle it. So when national separatism began to threaten that system, that above all threatened the wholesomeness of, of Soviet economy. There literally could be, you know, one little factory in somewhere in Armenia that produced necessary details for giant plants and factories all across Ukraine and Russia. So let's say this one factory uh, was affected by an ethnic strife and uh, would shut down. That would affect the entire economy in a sense. But even more, I was surprised to discover the importance of money. I mean, growing up in the Soviet Union, we were sort of taught that money is not so important. It's important to be an educated person and work hard and all that for your, for, for your socialist motherland. But, uh, you know, accumulation of money is wrong, morally wrong. Speculation is wrong and all these things. So to my surprise, I discovered that Soviet financial system was rather, rather uh, well thought through and, of course, adapt, adjusted to the uh, idea of socialism, I would say. Uh, most of enterprises, socialist enterprises, which is what, you know, Western corporations probably would be, uh, they operated on cashless principle. In other words, there were virtual money that could not be transferred into cash, sort of like a cryptocurrency of sorts that could never be turned into cash. Moreover, it was forbidden to turn this virtual currency into cash because uh, cash was used only for small transactions for paying salaries and wages to people. And uh, that was done to control inflation. And that worked pretty well. Of course, there was inflation, but even during the worst time of the Second World War, the Soviet finances did not collapse like they could have collapsed in any you know, in, in market economy. And what is interesting is that Gorbachev's reforms opened significant holes in this uh, divide between cashless economy and uh, economy based on cash, that is economy of, of consumption. And that the whole was kind of predictable. It was, it was surprising that a number of economists pointed to Gorbachev and the head of the government, Rishkov. Wait a minute, it's basically like, you know, you're in Titanic and you just punctured several important partitions in Titanic. And so the whole ship can submerge very quickly. And they don't listen. Uh, Gorbachev probably uh, did not listen because he couldn't comprehend that uh, system, that financial system. It is kind of, you know, counterintuitive, even even for well-prepared people. Uh, so indeed, the Soviet economy got several holes. You know, I mentioned Chernobyl. I, I you know, mentioned anti-alcohol campaign. But the biggest hole was the uh, authorization to state enterprises to keep profits and turn it into cash and engage in foreign trade uh, beyond the state control and also turn your profit into cash. And that kind of flood of cash 
without uh, appropriate partitions inside the Soviet financial system, this is what made the Soviet ship capsize in the end. So at the same time that he's undergoing those economic reforms, you you also describe the political reforms. Now, presumably, this is something, having been trained, uh, having had a legal education that Gorbachev had, he would have understood sort of what he was doing. What what were some of his some of his governance reforms, and how did those alienate sort of the the party elite, the nomenclature? Well, you mentioned you just mentioned um, the the republics, and uh, you know I should uh, before I speak about p- political reforms, I should mention the fact that there were fifteen republics in the Soviet Union, and constitutionally, those republics had the right of exit from the Union, and they were solemnly claimed to be sovereign. Of course, no one took that sovereignty uh, literally, and uh, nobody took constitution literally. So when Gorbachev uh, announced that there would be the political liberalization, political reforms, and he started it with all kinds of Leninist slogans, all power to the Soviet, uh, you know, we should give back uh, the, the real autonomy and powers to the republics. And it was sort of like back to Leninist proclaimed ideals that Lenin never meant to follow. In, in the early days of, of the Soviet Union. Lenin was all for the proletarian dictatorship, that is the party dictatorship, um, covered by all kinds of slogans. Gorbachev took those slogans literally and began to implement them. So indeed, in the essence, his political reforms began to devolve more and more authority to the republics, at least in public rhetoric. And this slogan, neo-Leninist slogan, idealistic slogan of power to the republics, and in part it was dictated by, you know, taking the Soviet constitution uh, seriously and taking it literally because it did promise the rights of the republic to do all kinds of things. And Gorbachev uh, would complain to the Politburo and to his uh, friends, oh, well, Stalin reduced what uh, was conceived under Lenin as a confederation uh, or federation to a unitary state. And that was, you know, we now should should take it back to federation, you know, to have real, real harmony between national republics and, and the center. And, uh, you know, he acted on it and quickly realized he was, you know, trading on the minefield because the first, what happened that the bolts uh, who had been annexed in 1940 as a result of the Nazi-Soviet pact, they realized, aha, Gorbachev is uh, heading in this direction, we'll take advantage of it. But the real uh, goal of the Baltic nationalists, and you know, even some communists who posed as communists, uh, was to take the Baltic uh, republics out of the Soviet Union. And uh, for a while, Gorbachev sort of, you know, didn't want to admit it fully because it would have meant that this whole ap- approach to the Soviet Union uh, was a failure. It was based on illusions, not not reality. So uh, then, of course, he faced a major, a major calamity and surprise in the form of the Russian separatism, because when, as a result of Gorbachev's freedoms and uh, uh, free elections uh, of March 1990, the new Supreme Soviet of the Russian Federation was elected and convened in Moscow. It immediately adopted almost unanimously the, the declaration of Russian sovereignty. And this declaration, in a sense, was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union, because Russia was a core republic. In fact, you know, it was never meant to be <laughs> even autonomous because it was the core, the basis on which the Soviet statehood or what a Soviet economy rested. Uh, so this uh, strange phenomenon of Russian separatism, I would even call it Brexit after Brexit, cannot be fully explained. For Westerners, for instance, it was a nonsense. They always assumed that the Soviet Union was a bigger Russia of sorts. And uh, for Russians themselves who voted for sovereignty, they never uh, imagine that this somehow could lead to the collapse of the entire state in the Soviet Union. It's a classic case of, uh, of the revolutionary period when people do something, even when they think about it, they don't think that it would lead to such far-reaching consequences. And uh, Gorbachev, again, in, in this case, was faced with a new political reality and he refused to think it through to the end. Essentially, the only way after that was I don't know, somehow to assume strong authoritarian presidency. 
And in March 1990, Gorbachev was elected the president of the Soviet Union. He was both the general secretary of the Communist Party and the president of the Soviet Union. And he was given, granted by, you know, the Congress of the USSR, all kinds of uh, highly dictatorial powers for emergency. Uh, but he never used those powers. He was not interested in and didn't know what to do with executive powers because, you know, to, frankly, to use executive powers at this revolutionary stage when everything became disbalanced and disputed, I ran a high risk of bloodshed and using force. And Gorbachev was a principled opponent to any use of force inside the country. I mean, we have a remarkable phenomenon of a head of the party the head of the Soviet Union, you know, the, the party in the state that had been uh, the children of blood and iron, sort of, the, the children of terror, all of a sudden renouncing all this terror in even the use of violence. And he, he even refused to use violence to preserve the common state. This is highly unusual. Even leaders of other states, of course, more democratic, you may say, always use force when they confronted with uh, disastrous separatism that threatens uh, their statehood. Uh, and Gorbachev refused to do. So let's rewind a little bit and, and move to more of the international arena. During the uh, section of the book where you talk about the collapse of the Berlin Wall, you quote William Taubman, the, the biographer of Gorbachev, who said that after the collapse of the wall, Gorbachev really started reacting to change as opposed to initiating change, paraphrasing here. I was wondering if you could sort of explain that concept and how Gorbachev came to view the collapse of the wall. Well, the wall was important, uh, but of course it was symbolically important above all. It, it wasn't that important in, in, in the story of the Soviet collapse. What happened, however, that the focus of, of world news shifted dramatically and irrevocably from what was happening in Moscow under Gorbachev uh, to what was happening in Germany and Eastern Europe. So uh, suddenly the Soviet Union was out of focus of world media. And it never returned to that focus, I would say, until August 1991, when all of a sudden there were tanks in Moscow, you know, a coup, and then uh, you know, all journalists of the world, including CNN, refocused on what was in the Soviet Union. And meanwhile, between November 89, when the wall fell, and August 1991, a lot of things went down the bridge in the Soviet Union. Huge changes that essentially went by wayside for most of the rest of the world. So now my argument is not only that Gorbachev lost initiative, and he did. I think I would argue he lost initiative even before the fall of the wall, because he sort of started his reforms in March, March, April 1989. And by the summer of 89, he faced uh, the consequences that he didn't expect, and he did not know what to do with those consequences. Workers' strikes, the Baltic independence bid, you know, all kinds of other stuff, economic and financial decline. Uh, he already basically had no strategy for, 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 for those consequences. But after November 89, he even, you know, stopped to be the main driver of change in Europe. You know, that his, his role uh, became different. He sort of began to be viewed by the West as the person who sort of presides over a hopefully peaceful decline of the empire. And, uh, you know, of course, in November 1990, he received the Nobel Prize for Peace uh, for basically condoning with the uh, reunification of Germany, despite half a million of Soviet troops in East Germany. So that was his new role. He was no longer the demiurge and you know, driver of change. He was the driver of, uh, let's say, peaceful decline and collapse of the state he presided over. Now, many of the, the analysts, though, at that time, I don't think we should, you know, they didn't necessarily think that the end of the empire meant the end of the Soviet state. Would you say that's accurate in Moscow? They thought, OK, they can withdraw from from Eastern Europe, but the Soviet state will still be around. Well, yes. Uh, and during 1990, and I would say until the spring of 1991, Practically no one, and by practically no one, I mean, you know, observers in, in, in the mainstream media, intelligence services, analysts in, in Western governments, and even inside the Soviet Union, 
believed that there was an automatic kind of uh, linkage between the fall of communism in Eastern Europe and inevitable collapse of the Soviet uh, state. But I remember uh, very clearly uh, that there was a connection between the fall of communist systems in Eastern Europe and communist systems in the Soviet Union. When I say system, of course, it's something different from the state. So the you know, illusion at the time among people, and I belong to the to those people at the time was that, uh, okay, communism would go away pretty much like in, uh, I don't know, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Poland. Uh, but, uh, you know, we would still live in, in the same state. So very few people paid very close attention to uh, ethnic separatism, Baltic bit of independence, and would say, oh, it's not only the Balts. If the Balts go, uh, then it would be, you know, a, a falling domino effect. And of course, very few people, I repeat, understood the implications of the Russian drive for sovereignty and declaration of sovereignty. Um, So people inside uh, the Soviet Union, particularly in Moscow, where the center of action always was during those times, they continued to shake things in expectation that, you know, one more push and the the, the rotten communist system would fall apart, but they never, never expected that with the system, the state itself would fall apart. And this is a cognitive blindness that I uh, distinctly remember. And in my interviews, when I was collecting evidence for the book, I raised this question with many people, particularly the Russians. And they said, oh, no, no, we never thought about it. We never Im- could imagine it. Let's move to really briefly to the to the relationship that Gorbachev had with the Bush administration. I was wondering if you could talk about the grand bargain that was proposed and and why the Bush administration pretty much ultimately rejected it. Well, the grand bargain was a the the idea of I would say a few economic and political entrepreneurs. It didn't come from government structures. It came from one young Soviet economist, uh, Grigory Yevlinsky, uh, who began to talk about shock therapy and IMF-approved reforms in the Soviet Union and, uh, you know, liberation of prices, for instance, and uh, and leap to the market, and argued that to make it politically acceptable, you know, everybody knew that such things could lead to uh, real social tension, you know, and that method was used in various countries of Latin America and produced military dictatorships there. And in Chile, of course, Pinochet most famously carried out those reforms. Uh, so uh, Lyubelinsky said, you know, if we want both a leap to the market and uh, somehow a movement, uh, evolution towards democracy and not back to authoritarianism, uh, we need some kind of cushion. We need, uh, you know, sort of a reserve of uh, foreign currency, uh, preferably dollars, that would uh, mitigate social consequences of price liberalization and, and inflation. Um, so he found uh, some, um, uh, some people in, in Washington and at Harvard that supported him. Graham Allison was very much moved by that grandiose task of bringing the Soviet economy to market and uh, to democracy. So he supported uh, Yavlinsky and they came up with this idea uh, that was called Grand Bargain. And Grand Bargain because, you know, that was a, a real bargain for Americans to give, I don't know, like, you know, $150 billion to the former enemy to turn it into friend. And it would be much less than otherwise the United States would have to spend if the Soviet Union goes back to bad ways and the Cold War would resume and so on and so forth. So Grand Bargain. Uh, the Bush administration immediately rejected that plan. And uh, uh, in the evidence that I could find uh, on the discussions of the White House, they never believed that Congress would authorize this money uh, because essentially American polity continued to treat the Soviet Union as an enemy, even despite the fact that uh, publicly it was declared that the Cold War was over. But uh, American polity lived much more under the inertia of the Cold War than the Soviet elites and Soviet public. In, in, you know, essentially in the Soviet Union, November 89 was the time when you know, Gorbachev declared the Cold War is over after the summit of Malta. And uh, even uh, the military, even the military industrial complex sort of complied with it. 
and began to reach out to the former enemy. You know, one of my discoveries was how eager was the Soviet military industrial complex to cooperate with the American military industrial corporations. So the Bush administration discussed it, uh, realized that Congress would never allocate the money. Moreover, the Bush administration itself thought that all this money would be wasted because Gorbachev had no viable program. But there was another underlining, underlining reason that uh, I found in the documents. The reason was why we should help the Soviet Union and the Soviet economy and finances to tide over during those difficult days. After all, we are not interested in the Soviet Union to remain a superpower at all. Some members of the administration spoke very clearly. Our interest is to turn the Soviet Union or Russia into a third-rate power, unable to have a big, you know, big military capacity that can threaten the United States and the world and so on and so forth. So the idea was let them, let, let the, you know, we should not help them uh, to remain a superpower. We should uh, wait until they would continue destroying themselves. We should only be interested in keeping this process peaceful and take care of nuclear weapons. So we're skipping over a lot here because we have a limited a limited time with you. We're skipping over the rise of Yeltsin and everything, but the book is full of so much detail. And I was wondering if you could just talk to us about Gorbachev's resignation speech, which was on December 25th, 1991. And you give some great detail about the speech in his book. I was I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that moment and what it meant for you being from the Soviet Union. Well, I, I don't actually remember that moment 30 years ago because by that time it was clear to everyone that the Soviet Union was finished. It was uh, finished uh, the, the jury uh, and de facto. And on December 8th, uh, the leaders of three so-called Slavic republics, the, the Russian Federation, Ukraine and Belarus, uh, met uh, very close to the Polish border and declared the Soviet Union as null and void, as the object of, uh, you know, as, as geopolitical reality and, and juridical subject. By the time Gorbachev gave his speech, everyone not only gave up on the Soviet Union, there was no protest, by the way, no open signs of discontent or, you know, let's, let me explain this a little bit for, for, for the listeners. Why nobody spoke up or marched uh, to preserve the Soviet Union? I think many people by that time became so, so befuddled and confused by all these changes in of political landscape and so consumed by, by everyday economic misery and uh, the search for goods, basic goods, that they didn't even pay attention how the name of the country changed. So when the leaders of the three republics declared, oh, this USSR is over, from now on, uh, there will be the Commonwealth of Independent States. And people <laughs> essentially shrugged it off. Okay, another name for the country, assuming that the country would stay together. So there was this illusion, particularly among the Russians, but not only the Russians. Second factor was that Gorbachev undermined his popularity by that time so thoroughly that he became an irrelevant figure. He lost his power after the August coup. Yeltsin seized it. Gorbachev continued to play a role of a sort of a persuader, trying to convince the, ch the chiefs of all these republics to come together and save the common country, talking to them like a solicitor almost, or insurance agent. Okay, you know, if you, if you go to different places, you know, it will be catastrophe for all of you. And, you know, he ended up becoming totally irrelevant. To such an extent, I would argue, that the army no longer listened to him. Uh, they followed Yeltsin, who, after all, gave them salaries from the budget of the Russian Federation. Um, the KGB was so demoralized that it uh, was uh, uh, out of picture. For a while, police, the same thing. And uh, the money printing press was in Yeltsin's hand by that time. So Gorbachev didn't have any control of money. What remains of Gorbachev is his title of president of the USSR and this so-called nuclear button. And the most poignant detail that I discovered that, you know, this so-called, uh, you know, nuclear suitcase that 
uh, was in the, sort of in the hands of the commander in chief, which uh, in theory Gorbachev still was until his resignation. That suitcase was probably already uh, disconnected. So, you know, that ceremony of Gorbachev's resignation and his subsequent passing of this nuclear suitcase to, you know, the Minister of Defense uh, of, I don't know what, the Soviet Union or Commonwealth of Independent States by that moment, it was already a, a piece of uh, ceremony that had nothing to do with the real transfer of nuclear power. So I have just one last question for you. While I have you here, I have to ask you about the buildup of of troops along the border of Ukraine. And I'm just wondering, as a as a Cold War historian and a historian of the Soviet Union, a lot of a lot of people say, at least in the Western media, that oh, Putin just wants to rebuild the empire. And I'd just like to get your thoughts on that. Uh, I may say something highly unpopular, but I don't believe in a moment that uh, Putin uh, wants to restore the Soviet Union. He said in the earlier days of his presidency that uh, the, uh, those people who want to restore the Soviet Union have no brains, and I think he sticks with this maxim to this day. Of course, the regime became more authoritarian and did uh, all kinds of provocative things and statements, and people uh, refer to that, usually saying that you know the regime became completely untrustworthy and unpredictable. But the situation with Ukraine has a, a long story, and it goes back exactly to the collapse of the Soviet Union, when uh, uh, Yeltsin and the first uh, president of Kravchuk signed uh, in a, a number of treaties to form the Commonwealth of Independent States. But pretty much immediately, the issue of Crimea blew up, the issue of Donbass. And there, there was this uh, feeling that the Commonwealth, so-called Commonwealth, uh, would uh, ran, uh, ran aground on, on the basis of tension between Ukraine and the Russian Federation. Uh, what Yeltsin uh, hoped that Russia would stay dominant, that Ukraine was so dependent economically in terms of oil supplies, in terms of culture, you know, and even ethnic mixed population on Russia, that uh, you know, Ukrainian independence would be impossible. So that situation was already bad enough and, uh, how to say, uh, pregnant with uh, various uh, conflicts. And even at the time, in November, in December 1991, quite openly in, in, in the press, in Moscow and Kiev, one could uh, read uh, uh, about uh, war scenarios. And even in nuclear Yugoslavia, you know, Yugoslavia was falling apart at the time, so they spoke that Ukrainian-Russian war could, could even go nuclear at the time. And that is without any NATO, without any NATO enlargement. But NATO, NATO's plans... When in 1997, Yeltsin and, and Clinton talked about NATO enlargement, uh, Yeltsin said uh, in, in no-nonsense terms, listen, Bill, we will not tolerate the expansion of NATO uh, into the former Soviet republics, particularly to Ukraine. So when in uh, 2008, in Bucharest, uh, Bush Jr. made this very provocative remark that uh, NATO is open to membership of uh, Ukraine and Georgia for Putin it was a, re a red line and it was a very bad signal. And I, I would say that uh, without it, probably what we would not have had what we're having now, including troop uh, concentrations. Uh, what it amounted to, at least as I understand Putin's reasoning, <laughs> people may say I'm... I, understand Putin too much. It is no longer fashionable, but I still I will say it. Uh, from Putin's perspective, NATO refuses to give Russia any voice in the process of uh, changing uh, European uh, security architecture. So but the United States clearly plays the first fiddle in this process, but Russia is denied any voice in it. So what kind of uh, voice Russia can have? Uh, you know, by making the West and primarily the United States listen. And how to do it uh, if the West refuses to listen by moving troops to the border? And this is what, what they do. So uh, it's highly provocative and dangerous. And I really hope that it will not lead to, to a real military clash. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for asking such intelligence questions.
The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please share The Lawfare Podcast and give us a five-star review on iTunes. Go to thelawfarestore.com for brand new Lawfare pens, lanyards, and t-shirts. The podcast is produced and edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer is Ian Enright of Goat Rodeo. Her music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.